because if any place demons tend to go, it's into the technology. <laughs> you know, he used to say when Satan fell, he fell into the choir loft. I don't know if you knew that or not, but uh, you heard that one before, Brother Bob? <laughs> Uh, Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, and uh, we're going to be looking at uh, what demons do, what are they like, and we talk, taught a similar lesson about angels on this earlier, and uh, fortunately the kids aren't in here tonight, because this one's kind of, this, this one we get into some things that are... Um, well, they're, they're concerning, uh, no doubt. And, um, but let's talk about what demons are like. They are uh, genuine persons. Okay, they're not, peop they're not humans, but they are persons. Let me g give you Mark 1.24. Uh, Jesus is confronted by a spirit, he says, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. Do you notice this demon talking to Jesus? That he is, um, he has a personal nature, in other words, he, he has intelligence, he knows Jesus, he knows his own doom, he knows, um, and, and in another place in scripture, oh, by the way, hashtag CBC Angels, if you want to pull up the scriptures for tonight uh, on the Twitter, uh, James 2.19, you all know this verse pretty well, I think, that James 2.19, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The angels also believe and, or the devils also believe and tremble. The devils also believe it. So they're, believe it or not, demons are monotheistic. They're monotheistic. They're intelligent. Um, and, and so in, in the case here that, that this demon is, is confronted with Jesus, he knows who Jesus is, he knows his doom, he knows that God is the one God. Notice their, their emotions as well. Uh, if in Luke chapter eight, and this one we'll spend some time in, so if you want to turn there, if, you, if you're not following along, Luke chapter 8, verses 27 to 32, there's the confrontation with uh, the, the man who's possessed, the legion, the Gadarean um, um, lunatic. And, and as he is um, conversing with Jesus, you see the fear that the demons have over judgment. So you see their emotion, they have emotion. He, he's saying, uh, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice said, what have we to do with thee? Jesus, thou son of God most high, I beseech thee, torment me not. So there's the begging and the pleading and you hear an emotional appeal from this demon. So there, there there's, the, all the elements that make up a person in, in these beings. Also, they have a will. Uh, in that same passage, the demons make a request. You know, they, they, um, they ask that they could be uh, not tormented. They, they have a will, they have a desire. Um, it, look at verse 27, and when he went forth, there met him out of the city a certain man who had devils a long time, wore no clothes, neither abode in any house but in the tombs. Uh, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, and then if you looked on verse 29, he said, for he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oft times it had caught him and kept him, and he was kept bound with chains and fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils had entered into him. 
And um, in verse 32, and there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them, and he suffered them. So, so they have a will, they have a desire. So they express to Jesus, we don't want to go into torment, we want to go into these pigs. Of course, we all know that what happened was the pigs all ran off the cliff into the water and committed suicide. Well, that's an old one. <laughs> that's bad. All right, but, but they have a will. And then they have personality. They have personality. You can see the personal pronouns being exchanged here. I, uh, I, uh, you know, we. You, you, so so there's, there's personality. Now, uh, think of it this way. Okay, there's, there's we don't know how many of the, these demons there are. There's millions of them. And they all have personalities, just like there's millions of people, and people all have personalities. Some of these demons would probably be very meek, and when you would, if, if we could see them and converse with them, we would probably think, hey, you know, they're, they're not such a bad guy. They, they, and then there's some that would be just crazed maniac lunatics like we've seen demonstrating on the television. I mean, so I'm, I'm just saying, you, you get a picture, there's a broad range of influence that these demons have, and I want you to get that picture because as we develop a little bit more in here of what they do, it'll give us more of an idea of how they get involved in the things that people would say, well, there can't be any demons involved in that. Oh, oh, yeah, there can be. It may look like a very good thing that's being done, but the power behind it could very much be demonic. Because the devil is always involved in deception. So they're spirit beings also. They're... They're spirit beings, they're not flesh and blood, but they're localized. Now, that's hard to understand. We can't see them. But they cannot occupy more than where they are. Uh, they're a spirit being. The, the devil can't be, he's not omnipresent. Although he can spread around his influence using all these demons, but he is not omnipresent. God's omnipresent. The devil is not. Neither is his, uh, are his beings. Matter of fact, you could see in this case, because they, they are spirit beings, here's a man who could have a legion of demons in him because they're spirit beings. But they're still localized. They're in this one man. And, and so you, you can get that, that picture. And, and Acts 19.15 where the sons of Sceva are trying to cast out uh, a man, uh, demons out of a man. It said, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Um, you can hear the personality being spoken by this demon, and it says the evil spirit. So these are spirit beings, but they're, he's talking through a man. He's talking through uh, a, a possessed man. And in Revelation chapter 9, all through Revelation chapter 9, there's a description of this demonic horde of locusts. I mean, and they are horrendous looking. If you look at what they look like, you know, it, it talks about that they would, um, they, they, they look, they had the face of, they had the hair of a woman, they had the faces of a man. They had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. The sound of their wing was as the sound of chariots, many horses running into battle. They had tails like unto scorpions. Some people thought, have thought at times that these are helicopters because of the way they're described. But they come out of the bottomless pit, and their king, it says in verse 11 of Revelation chapter 9, they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon, which means destroyer. So these are 
a description of demons. This is what they look like. Now, we can't see them without spiritual eyes. But this is John is, is able to see them and describe them. So very horrendous looking beings, just like the cherubim who have four faces that Ezekiel is able to see, these holy creatures that God has carry his throne, have four faces all around their head. Uh, we're not used to seeing something like that, but that's described by Ezekiel because he could see something spiritually. So they're spirit beings. They have an appearance to them. It's just that we can't see it in the realm we live in right now. So they're spirit beings. Now, again, their intellectual nature, um, remember we already talked about their intelligence. They, they know Jesus, they know their doom. But here's what they do in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and this is important to know. They know their fate. But 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So we see their intellectual nature that they actually are able and have put together and promote systems of doctrine. They have a system of doctrine that they, they promote and teach or, and push throughout the world. They know history. They've been around a long time. They know humans, and they know human nature. And because of that, they have the ability to predict human action. And also, they have the ability to influence human action. So when you consider all of that power which they possessed in that way, which they possess in that way, you can see that intellectually, they really have an influence on what goes on in the world. As a matter of fact, now, that's a blurry picture that I took. It, it's not on. Nothing's on. Nothing's hooked up. All right, wake up. Okay, that's on. Oh, see? When did it, did, was it on it ever? Never been on. All right. Well, let's, we will get it on because I've got some good pictures, and the devil knows that. Oh, there's nothing coming out of the. Wake up, Apple TV. Didn't we have problems with this Sunday night, too? There we go. Okay, it's a blurry picture. You really haven't missed anything I've been saying, you know, just their intellectual nature. And, and this blurry picture, though, is a used bookstore. And at this used bookstore, if you, if you were to look close, those are all books about angels and the occult at a used bookstore. And I mean, that was just one rack. They're all through, if you go into a bookstore, You'll find racks and racks of these. If you look, and we already talked about even angels and false view of angels at the beginning when we were talking about the existence of angels. They fill volumes with their doctrine. They are intellectual beings, and they promote false doctrine. The biggest false doctrine the demons promote is that somehow... You can work your way into heaven. And that man can lift himself up 
to God's level. Every cult, every false religion is built on that basis. And uh, the demons work that even into Christianity. So this is their big influence. Now we'll talk a little bit more about how their intellectual presence and, and, and uh, prowess is exhibited in some other ways as well. Their immoral nature. All right, remember when I talked about you might see a demon and say, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't seem so bad. <laughs> you know, might have a very pleasant personality. I mean, the Satan himself presents himself as an angel of light. And, uh, and since they are persons, but here's what the Bible says every time it describes one of these. In Matthew 10, 1, uh, he said he called his 12 disciples and gave them power against unclean spirits. Luke 7, 21, and in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. Evil spirits. And then in, in Luke 4, 33, in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. So you see, every time they're described, wicked, unclean, evil. Uh, Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I mean, their, being, their main desire is towards evil and immoral. And, and the thing is that it, it, it may not be, we always think of, okay, wicked, immoral, then it's going to be all the dirty, icky type of things that go on in the world. But it can be in a very organized, remember these, these were angels. They lived in holy heaven and they watched God receive worship. So they desire worship as well. So some of their systems they organize is to get worship to directed towards them. And it can be very beautiful ceremonies, uh, very orderly events. You know, we only think of things like the voodoo out of the Haitians or the animism in, in some of the tribes in Africa. But you get into, uh, you get into uh, high church things that have long ago abandoned Christ. And all of a sudden there's all this form and pomp and circumstance. Don't doubt that demons are behind that. And they may be in the beautiful and possessing a beautiful golden temple in India, just beautiful, ornate. As a matter of fact, someone told me there's one place in India where you go in and it actually has all these demons all over. Just, I mean, it, it, the whole temple is built towards the really grotesque. And then they have the ones built for the very beautiful. And we, we don't think of it in that way. But he, here, here's a guy that for a long time, he wrote a book, his name is Ernest, that's the last name, Ernest. He wrote a book called I Talked With Spirits. So there's evil immorality and there's what I would quote, quote, good immorality or what we would say pleasant looking immorality or a beautiful immorality that just means it takes people away from the goodness of God and directs them towards blindness and superstition and other things that keep them from knowing God and, and believing him. Now, here's a quote from, from this guy. He said this, and he was a, by the way, he was a minister, okay? This, this was a minister. The spirits I encountered at seances were for the most part very moralistic. 
They encouraged us not to smoke or drink or do anything else that would harm our minds and bodies. Now, doesn't that sound like back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, where he said, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with, you know, a real ascetic lifestyle. Or do anything that would harm our minds and bodies. We'd say, oh, these, these are people we'd like to have in our church. Ministers were told to preach morality, good manners, and civic pride. I knew ministers who actually had spirit messages taken down by their secretaries and then used them from the pulpit. They were taking spiritual dictation. Now, I've heard of this. You know, I've heard, I've heard of... of uh, Poets supposedly trying to tap into a spirit guide to get guidance how to write a poem or to write things. And we know about our transcendentalists that have come up through the ages uh, who uh, tap, try to tap in to nature and, and, and get influence from somewhere else other than God. And the spirits often talked about an ethical Jesus. In other words, they're not afraid they're not afraid to use Jesus' name, but never about the Savior who died a sacrificial death, death for sin. Did we sing There's Power in the Blood tonight? We did? Good, good. I didn't get to hear that. I chose that for a reason. Power in the blood. They hate the blood of Jesus. Absolutely despise the blood of Jesus. I've attended one ministerial association meeting in my, in my ministry life. The ministerial association, when we were in Cleveland, I was a youth pastor, and the ministerial association scheduled the preachers into the nursing homes. So there was something coming up, and, and the pastor and I attended one ministerial association meeting in this town just to make sure we were still getting into the rotation to get into the nursing homes because we wanted to make sure we could get into the nursing homes and preach, preach the gospel there. It was one, it, it's still one of, you know, it gave, gives me some great illustrations even to this day. This was a number of years ago. I remember the head of the association sitting at the head of it smoking a pipe. And, you know, just kind of sit back real dignified. He, I think he was Lutheran. But the Episcopalian guy, he was a young guy, and he was unhappy with the hymn books that were in the nursing homes. He said, can we do something to get rid of those bloody hymn books? They just sing about blood all the time. And those old people, that's all they want to sing about is the blood this and the blood that. Now, you know, when you're sitting at a minister, that's the last thing you, I mean, you hear about it in, you know, you hear about these liberals that don't believe the Bible and, and don't believe in the blood when you're in school. But to actually sit across from one, uh, and, and so the old Lutheran with his pipe, he goes, what's wrong with the blood? So at least he, he stood up for the blood, and, was, and so did we. I mean, the reason those people want to hear the blood is because that's their hope. You know, that's what saved us. That's what makes it possible for us to go to heaven. They hate the blood of Jesus. They know that that's where God said all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. This is what's going to crush Satan's head. You know, we only got to crush his heel but he will crush Satan's head. Can you believe, though, that these are ministers supposed to be ministering in Christian churches, getting their messages from seances and from demons? Here's the last quote you would see. In contrast to the high moral and ethical tone of seances in our home, I tended some where spirits were blasphemous and sensual, which is how we would expect the demons to be. And, and believe me, they are. And they are involved in much of what you see in the spiritual influence, in the party culture and all of that that goes on in the world. So they are 
intellectual, and they are immoral in their very being and in their goals. Their goal is to pull worship away from God and pull worship to themselves. Or at least just get it away from God. Now we know they do not have bodies. And indications are in Hebrews, as we looked way, if you remember way back, we talked about the creation of angels. It says God made them to be spirits of, or spirits of fire. And the indication is that God is the one that gives them the bodies that they use. When they appear physically, most of the time they appeared as men. When, when like Isaiah saw the cherubim in the temple, then they, they appeared with the wings, the six wings, the seraphim. And the cherubim then that are with the four faces, that's what Ezekiel saw. And again, John saw in the book of Revelation, they were called the four creatures. Um, their, their bodies are given to them by God. But demons tend, it, 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 it is evident that they tend to want to inhabit things, people, or animals. They have a power to do that. Um, they, they, they seek out and look for ways to possess a person or an animal. We saw, we saw them requesting to go into an animal. And I believe also they, they inhabit and possess physical places as well. And this is where we would get all of those things like that we call haunted houses, haunted areas, spiritual places like out in the West where the Indians would, would go and worship. And uh, still to this day, I, I have a friend who works with the Navajos and they have you know, those special mountains that they just, they just say they're, they're, they're holy and special to their gods. And the temples that are in the Far East, uh, many, many stories about those, but they have power, they have power, they have ability, um, we know to possess, we have the man, the, the Gadarean, uh, Mark 5, 3 said, he had his dwelling among the to tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Uh, if you read about that, that man, you know, who ran around without any clothes on, cut himself, screaming. In our day and age, if we hung a guitar around his neck, he would probably be very popular and on television. <laughs> he, it's, I mean, it's sad, but there is a strength there, and it, it should not be underestimated. The, the men who, uh, the sons of Sceva, who tried to confront the demon after seeing Paul cast out demons in Acts 19.16, the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So there's almost a super strength to this possessed man. Now, people who who work in the medical field and those things who've seen people who are high on certain drugs exhibit this kind of super strength. Um, but this is not something to be messed with. When I was presenting this at uh, Grace, one of the ladies mentioned that there was a demon-possessed man, she was in Bible college, who kept trying to kill her. And they had to separate her from this man, and they kept trying to get rid of this guy and get him out. But he kept escaping. She said they, uh, he would just end up in a room she would be in. They were, they'd be trying to hide her, and he would somehow get in there. Said it was just, it was, it was crazy. Um, another case, uh, one, of, one of the men told us about a, a, a village that a missionary went to, where they, they claimed there was a red devil. A red devil that would attack this one house out, out on the edge of the village. 
I mean, they, they, and the missionary is going, yeah, right, you know. Uh, and he said, so he, he went there one night. And sure enough, this red-eyed thing came out of the woods close to this house, came into the house, and things started flying all over the room. And he, you know, as a good minister would do, he ran. He said, and that's the last time, he said, that's the last time I went there at night. He said, I took my Bible and went there during the day, started dealing with the people in the house. They got saved, they would pray, and guess what? The red devil stopped coming. God doesn't tell us to go hunting these things. And, and you know, as far as exorcisms, I think it, it can be done, but it's something that I don't think any pastor should go out hanging a shield, shingle out saying, I will perform exorcisms if you'll call me or put up a website, you know, contact me if you want exorcism. I think you're inviting tr spiritual trouble into your own life. Because what God has given us here in his word he tells us what they're up to. He tells us they're seducing spirits. He tells us they, that we can be aware of the wiles of the devil. He tells us we have means to escape his temptations. And so it, it's where, this is where we need to be, and our focus should be on the most powerful creator, and that's, that's God himself, and Jesus, the power of his blood, and most importantly, his resurrection from the dead. They cannot battle the truth of the gospel. And even if you cast a demon out of someone, Jesus himself even said, the demon can go wandering out. If there's no change in the person's life, he can go wandering out, and grab together seven more of his buddies, and come right back to that individual, and his state will be worse than it was before. It's not casting the demons out of the person. It's the person being redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's where the power is. And so, you know, we can get, we get these are powerful beings. And to try to handle them on our own, we may be presumptuous, you know. And even in our, our own wisdom, I had, a, I had a theology professor who says, you know, you just really can never be totally sure, you know, that what you're seeing is actually demon possession. I mean, we've all, if we've lived long enough, maybe come across things where we would say, hmm, yeah, that one, I, I don't know. That one looks like it, it could be. But to say 100% sure, and uh, that, that's just not in our purview. We can't see if someone is. But we know how to pray, and we know the power of God's word, and we know the power of blood of Jesus Christ. And I tell you, anybody you run into that's going off, off crazy like that, you start quoting scripture, and I've, I've had a few people who call me, you know, the, these, these protest-like people. Uh, we, we were having a, a group come to our church, and they were, they were calling. They were, like, calling every hour or two. You know, they were on their somehow get us to back down from having this group come to our, our, our school. This was down at, up in Middletown, and it was the heritage people, you know, promoting family values. You know, their bus was going around probably during an election, and they, were going to, they wanted a place to stop them, and I said they could use our parking lot. You know, I'd just, I'd just start witnessing to them. You know, I mean, what else? they have a script. Boy, you get them off the script, they're in trouble. And I'd just start witnessing to them. I'd tell them, you know, they'd tell me how, you know, if you really loved God, you wouldn't let these people come because they promote teen suicide and all this, you know, because you're teaching 
family values, that's going to cause teens to commit suicide. And I said, oh, when was the last place the bus was? And they, they would tell me, and I said, and, and how many teen suicides happened there after the bus was there? <laughs> they're, they're gone. They, they're off script. They don't know what to say. And then I'd start saying, you know, God does love everybody. He loved everybody so much he wants to change us. We're all born sinners, and that's why Jesus came. He came to die, and I just keep, they keep trying to give me something else. I finally stopped calling. Because the gospel, the gospel makes the difference. Their strength, their intelligence, this is the third time I've talked about that. They're smart. They've been around a long time. They're always going to be smarter than us. That's why we need the help of, the, of God and his wisdom. And then their presence. One last thing I want to mention. Their presence. In Acts 16.16 16, it says, came to pass as we went to prayer a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying demons are involved in all of the fortune telling and all of the horoscope things and all of those things that go on don't get fooled don't get hoodwinked into following those things God's told us, and he's mapped out, the plan for the ages. Pastor's just gone wrapping it up in the book of Daniel. So much in there parallels what we've been studying here. Demons are at work in every corner of the world system. They can at any time be possessing animals, humans, places. They're very smart. They're very intelligent. But the last point is... God is greater than all of these. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being such a great God and sending such a great Savior. Uh, Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his power to save us and rescue us from the, this demon horde that wants to keep the world in darkness. Lord, we thank you for people who have surrendered themselves and given themselves to go into some of these very dark places of the world to shine the light of the gospel. Thank you from those who, for those who have been changed and brought out of this darkness into the glorious light. And Lord, help us to also realize that some of our very neighbors sitting around us are in just as dark a place. This, the demonic doctrines of this world have blinded so many, but Lord, the glorious light of your gospel can shine through. Lord, give us that faith and encouragement and, and, and uh, boldness to shine that light in the most darkest recesses of our world and to shine them to our neighbors and to our friends and our loved ones. Lord, because we know you will change lives and you can rescue them from a hell that is prepared for the devil and his angels. Lord, they should not be going there. And you can give them eternal life. And that can be found in Jesus Christ, the most powerful one, the one who conquered death and who's coming soon. It's in his name we pray. Amen.